uh, Dimitris Papadimitriou, I'm the uh, director of the uh, Manchester Jean Monnet Centre of Excellence, which brings together expertise from the University of Manchester and Manchester Metropolitan University, and encourages debate of all different kinds on uh, matters European, and of course the European, uh, the European Union. Let me first say thank you for coming, it's a beautiful day. Uh, um, uh, that shows a great deal of uh, uh, commitment and uh, determination, and uh, I'd say the same to our speakers, but at least there's a prize for them at the end of all of this. Uh, uh, there is no prize for you, so uh, thanks again for, uh, um, 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 for coming. Uh, we're here to debate uh, Brexit and its impact on Manchester, and in particular its impact on the uh, substantial uh, uh, um, uh, European community in Manchester. Uh, uh, there are over 100 and 20,000 EU nationals living in Greater Manchester. So um, what we will be discussing today matters to a great deal of people. A great deal, uh, um, matters a great deal and to a great, deal, uh, to a great number of people. So um, we are delighted that we have uh, um, uh, uh, the candidates of the four uh, main parties uh, um, uh, uh, here in Manchester. Um, uh, Sean uh, uh, Anstey from uh, the Conservative uh, uh, Party Andy uh, Burnham for, uh, for Labour, Jane uh, Brotley from uh, uh, the Lib Dems, and uh, Will Patterson from uh, the Greens. We have invited the uh, UKIP uh, um, uh, candidate as well, but uh, um, he, didn't, he didn't come. Uh, and I'm sure there are others uh, who will be contesting the elections that cannot be um, uh, uh, with us today. But uh, um, for those who could make it, uh, thank you uh, very much for, uh, um, uh, for coming. In terms of uh, um, the... Um, the format of the discussion. We have agreed that uh, each candidate will uh, uh, speak for five minutes at the beginning, uh, a short uh, opening uh, statement, and then we will open up uh, 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 the floor to discussion. Uh, please keep that in mind. We have three uh, uh, sort of themes that we'll be addressing for the next uh, hour and a half. The first one is uh, uh, the economic implications of Brexit on Manchester. So if you have any questions on that particular uh, topic, Please uh, wait for uh, the first uh, uh, set of uh, uh, discussion. There is a second uh, a theme that is uh, uh, focusing on European nationals in Manchester and uh, uh, what uh, Brexit means to them and what are the likely uh, implications for them there. So if you have any, question on, uh, any questions on um, EU nationals in Manchester, keep it for the second uh, uh, round of discussion. And then uh, um, there is a third uh, a theme on uh, Brexit regional development, and uh, um, uh, DEVOMANC. So again, if you have questions about uh, 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 regional development projects and uh, how will devolution, uh, um, the devolution process square with uh, Brexit, keep your questions for, uh, for that. Um, I'm delighted to be asked to host this, uh, this discussion, and uh, the, uh, the Jean Monnet Centre is providing the home here, but uh, really a lot of the credit should go to uh, 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 the three million organisation, and particularly uh, uh, Christina uh, Tegoro, uh, who uh, has uh, done a lot of the legwork in uh, uh, preparing this uh, fantastic event. It's a, um, it's a grassroots initiative, and we like that. Uh, we like it because it's, uh, uh, what is going to happen in, in May is an exercise in local democracy, but uh, of course local democracy need people like Christina to get others organized, right, and uh, uh, get them to, uh, to debate things, so it's uh, uh, terrific that uh, um, uh, uh, that uh, this event is, uh, is taking place. We'll try and uh, approach it uh, um, in a uh, calm manner, uh, give uh, uh, um, um, all of the speakers the opportunity to develop their, uh, their ideas, but of course we are a university, uh, and uh, uh, part of uh, life in university is to challenge, uh, and we'll try and do that, but uh, always within the confines of uh, a civilized discussion and uh, 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 good spirit. So uh, I will uh, ask our speakers to uh, um, uh, proceed with their opening statements. Uh, we will take them in alphabetical order. So I'll ask uh, Sean to, uh, to go first. Sean, the floor is Well, Dimitri, thank you very much. And, uh, and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thank you for coming uh, here today. It's really appreciated. I, I probably just, should just start by saying, um, on the theme of this debate, I voted to remain uh, in the European Union, campaign uh, to remain uh, in the EU. I still think that would have been in the best interest uh, of Greater Manchester, uh, but clearly we're leaving. And so I'll maybe just expand uh, on that and some of my thoughts around that as we go through what I want to say. But in May, this is a pretty historic moment for uh, Greater Manchester. For the first time, we'll be electing 
uh, the Mayor of the city region trying to bring together all parts of Greater Manchester with some significant powers coming uh, from London and Westminster uh, here to uh, Greater Manchester for us to be able to take choices on things around skills, employment and health and social care and transport, planning and policing. Uh, all of these things that I think we're better placed uh, to be able to take uh, decisions. And what I've said in my campaign is that we need to put attracting, the first priority is attracting uh, inward investment in skills, jobs, housing and transport because I think everything hangs off that. Everything else that we want to do here in Greater Manchester uh, is, is, is imperative for us to be able to say that if we want all parts of uh, the, the conurbation to be able to realise their potential, then we need to make sure that we've got better quality jobs, we've got more highly skilled people, we've got investment coming into uh, Greater Manchester, which if we do, then we can be doing something so fundamentally different that it will have a profoundly positive impact uh, on the lives of uh, people who live and work here. And I think about you know, the concept of devolution, uh, one that I've been involved in now for a number of years to be able to get us to this point as the, as the leader of uh, Traffic Council. Um, devolution to me is about us saying that you know, if we get decisions here, that we've got to be able to take different decisions. If we just take the same decisions that are being made at the moment, then what's the point in having decisions taken uh, closer to home? And we've got to think about uh, how we can join things together. Um, we've got to think about as we repatriate power from the European Union, that that shouldn't mean a centralisation of power uh, into Westminster. That's got to be, got to be a concurrent uh, discussion about redistributing power across uh, the United Kingdom at the same time. Uh, because I think actually that centralisation into Westminster would be negative uh, for uh, our politics in, in this country. Uh, I also think there's four things that we need to try and get um, out of uh, negotiations in the coming There's many more than four things, but four key things. I think we need to try and focus on. One is Greater Manchester's place, uh, both at having a, a great trading relationship with the European Union and the rest of the uh, world. How do we make sure our interests in Greater Manchester are protected? Secondly, we know that we've been a net recipient of ERDF and ESF funding over many years. That money has to be replaced uh, for Greater Manchester because it's important, it's paying for things like some of the skills, support that we give to people, some of the transport improvements that we've seen. I want to see and make sure that that's the case. Thirdly, we've got to think about how we might be able to support uh, businesses across uh, Greater Manchester with greater levels of support uh, than perhaps what we're able to do today so that we can try and make them more resilient to withstand what is going to be a very turbulent uh, process over the coming years. And fourthly, we've got to support our universities uh, in uh, Greater Manchester uh, as you know, homes of research, of science and innovation uh, and make sure that international students uh, are welcome into our uh, city region really important point to them. If we do those four things alongside uh, some of this, then we will be uh, trying to help the resilience of uh, Greater Manchester. And just the final uh, two things that I'll uh, touch on. Uh, one is the Mayor is going to be the Police and Crime Commissioner for Greater Manchester. They will have a huge role in making sure that we are a city that celebrates our diversity, but also champions our togetherness as one place, uh, as one world. We need to make sure that people uh, of all different communities, of all different backgrounds, um, have uh, every opportunity to realise their potential in uh, Greater Manchester, and that means that we need to have communities where that are tolerant, open, and safe. Um, and so I think the mayor will have a key role uh, in, in leading that in, in future. So uh, I think just to, to, to wrap up, this is a, uh, an opportunity for us to do something uh, very differently in May. I'm very much looking forward to the debate that we're going to have uh, this afternoon, and um, uh, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for speaking to uh, the council as well. Andy? Who is speaking? Jane. Ah, okay. Jane? Yeah. Uh, five minutes. Right now, sorry. Good afternoon, everybody. Well, it will come as no surprise to you that here I'm from the Liberal Democrats, Jane Brophy, and I campaign passionately to run in the European Union. I still think that's the, the way forward, that we keep our very, very close links with the European Union, especially with Greater Manchester. I don't think that people actually voted for the sort of hard Brexit we're actually seeing the Conservatives put us forward for right now. I think that uh, people voted for a departure of the European Union, they didn't really vote for the destination. And I'd like to see people of Greater Manchester have a say on what deal actually is negotiated in the European Union. So I think that's important to all our futures, and I'll explain why. Because I think that in Greater Manchester, all of our 
structures and our policies are actually underpinned by our relationship with the European Union. And I'll start with our universities. I was extremely sad when we voted to leave the European Union because of that special relationship of our universities with research in the European Union. And it, it's, I realise that everybody's doing everything they can to make sure the funding remains so we get the same level of research for our universities. But I think that's going to be a challenge. I think our universities are going to potentially lose out because we are losing our relationship with the European Union. So I will fight to keep that. Secondly, in transport as well, we know that um, the Metrolink was funded by European Union funding. Again, I think um, we need to make sure, as your Mayor of Greater Manchester, that we fight to get the best possible deal so that we can keep the funding for our transport networks. And like many of the candidates here, I will, as your Mayor, be arguing for funding to, to come from the South East to Greater Manchester so that we do get that funding for our transport infrastructure. <coughs> I still think we are losing out from our changing relationship with the European Union. Our um, NHS, I work for the NHS, have done for all my professional life across Greater Manchester, not currently in Greater Manchester, but I have a lot of experience in working in the NHS. And it concerns me that we're losing the staff for, with many of our, 7% of our staff are um, from the European Union. Now, if those people who support our NHS don't feel welcome anymore, that we have enough recruitment difficulties within the NHS already, I'm very worried about the fact that we will have recruitment difficulties in our NHS, but also in social care as well. We rely a lot on our um, EU um, residents to provide social care in this country. So it concerns me a lot for our future uh, skills and employment that we won't have in European Union residents here to take those jobs. But actually, it's more than that, isn't it? It's also, I think, when we took that debate to um, vote for, remain, or leave, it kind of unleashed things within our country that I would rather not have unleashed. It's kind of, um, Sean referred to it a little bit in his speech, it's, it's kind of unleashed a division in society, and I'm, I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned about the impact it has on our di diverse populations in Greater Manchester, that somehow it seems to have um, made it worse for our, you know, pop our diverse populations within Greater Manchester. So as the Crease and Crime Commissioner role, I will make sure we fight that as well, so that we make sure that we have an open, tolerant, united, diverse Greater Manchester. So I launched my manifesto yesterday, and um, here it is. And top of my agenda as well as the Democrat candidate is I will fight against the hard Brexit that we're seeing. I don't think it's necessary that we have to have that. I still believe we should fight to keep our close links with the European Union. And I look forward to the debate and hearing more from throughout the questions about how we go about maintaining those close possible links with the European Union. I'm standing to be your mayor because I want an open, tolerant, diverse, united Greater Manchester. I think we're an internationalist city and we should keep going and I think we should all just step forward together to have a close, internationalist, vibrant, um, positive, optimistic Greater Manchester. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think also I'm speaking to them. Andy, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, like everybody on the panel, I voted uh, very proudly and strongly remain and just over a year ago made a speech as Shadow Home Secretary setting out what I believe to be the patriotic uh, case uh, to vote remain. I think that's even stronger today as we sit here, as we see the, the growing fragmentation around the country and particularly developments in Scotland make me very sad. Actually, I argued in the last parliament against the referendum. It wasn't an easy position to hold, but that was the Labour position in the last uh, Parliament, and I actually look back and think that was the right, uh, the right position, because we went into this referendum, because Jane just said, we unleashed all of this stuff without a proper it being thought through. I think it was uh, the right wing of the Tory party uh, dictating things and actually has dragged us to this position of where we are today, which is not uh, an easy uh, position to be in. You know, I, um, as I say, I voted to remain at uh, my wife is Dutch uh, and so you know I know very well the trauma that everybody's been living through over the last year and that is how it has felt everything that has been there throughout our lives has been thrown upside down and the question is how now to make uh, to make sense of it in terms of politics I think this is the biggest 
change and the biggest challenge we will all ever go through in our lives. Because if you think about it, whoever is elected mayor, they are being elected to represent a city region that is very, was very divided on referendum day. Uh, 600,000 people voted uh, to remain, roughly. 700,000 people uh, voted to leave. And that is the essential context for all of our consideration today. You know, the, the mayor would have to have a regard for all of those people and all of their concerns in trying to unite our city region, because that is the, the crucial thing. And I, I also, I mean, I personally believe that this will be the, having been in Westminster and seen this unfolding over the last year, it, it, it will require um, real uh, leadership, judgment, skill to make sure the interests of Greater Manchester are properly represented uh, in this process. And I believe I'm the candidate in this race who's best able uh, to do that. I challenged David Davis in the House of Commons a few weeks ago uh, to ask for a seat for Greater Manchester at the, at the table when it comes to uh, negotiating the terms of Brexit. To be honest, I think we've had the foamy war for last year. The real thing is happening, mm -hmm. about to happen now, and it's critical that you've got somebody who can speak strongly for you, for Greater Manchester, in that process. I, I got a concession that we would have a meeting in June with the newly elected mayors and the, and the government. I think the government should go further and set up a Brexit committee of the regions and nations. It's not good enough just to have the odd meeting or listen to our voice every so often. There must be a permanent place for Greater Manchester at the table uh, when these decisions are being taken. Because my great fear, having been a government minister before, I, I know what will be top of the government's um, set of negotiating demands when it finally gets to those talks in Brussels. It's the city of London, quite simply. Uh, and Europe knows that as well. And I think that the danger of a London-centric Brexit is a very real one. And we need to get our voice heard. And I believe I'm best placed uh, to do that. As I say, I've challenged um, the government and got that concession. But also, in, in the immediate aftermath of the referendum, I was the first person to bring a debate to the House of Commons to try and secure the position of EU nationals. It was within uh, 10 days of the referendum uh, results, and we... Uh, we, we won a very clear, uh, clear vote. The will of the House of Commons was clear that day. And I must say, I cannot believe why the government hasn't resolved this question. It's a major mistake, in my view, to leave this uncertainty hanging over, not just the three million people affected, but also over all of society, because it creates conditions of uncertainty in communities. It creates uh, the potential for more hate crime to take place when people haven't got that certainty in their own life. It's absolutely wrong, in my view to say that the interests of British nationals who've made their lives somewhere else take precedence over people who came here to contribute to our society and work in our, our public services. So I feel the government has got its approach to Brexit uh, profoundly wrong and I have argued that uh, since the referendum and will continue to do that and believe I'm best placed for the candidates to get your voice heard. But I also want to say a little bit why I think the position that I will argue is also the right one. Uh, and it, it's not easy, because many people who still feel angry about the referendum would think, well, they sh we should still be fighting it. We should still be rerunning it. I honestly don't believe that the Mayor of Greater Manchester should, should do that. Uh, because, as I said, we've got a divided situation here. And if it look, I think in the current climate, we've got some people speaking for the 52%, or appear to be, and then others speaking for the 48%. I, I feel that is problematic, if that's how the public perceive it. Because it looks as though the political class is trying to uh, argue its way out of the referendum result or, or promote the interests of one side above another. I think the Mayor of Greater Manchester has got to begin to bring our, our city region together and use the opportunity that Brexit presents, uh, sorry, that devolution presents, to differentiate ourselves as Greater Manchester from the rest of the UK, send a different message to Europe. I am pro-European to my core uh, and uh, pro-international, uh, internationalist to my core. As Mayor of Greater Manchester, I would continue to argue for a, a positive, outward-looking Greater Manchester on the national uh, stage and bring people back together and put forward a positive vision uh, for what we do and how we succeed as Greater Manchester post-Brexit. I put young people at the heart of my manifesto because I think this approach of taking support away from young people uh, by politicians that we've seen over recent times was never right, actually, the trebling of tuition fees. It was never right, but it's absolutely profoundly wrong now if we want to make this place successful in the future, we will need to, to build a highly trained, highly motivated workforce so that we can attract inward investment in Greater Manchester from Europe uh, and around the world. I've put forward a plan to make the best of Brexit for Greater Manchester. 
I think we need to see change to immigration that does least damage to our economy, that keeps us as an open, outward-looking Greater Manchester, and as I say, increasingly differentiates ourselves against, against the, the hard Brexit being pushed by the Tory party, which, like Jane, I will fight all the way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, thank you, Demetrius, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming here on such a beautiful day outside. Uh, I was a leader in the uh, local Remain campaign in Wigan. I was out every free moment I got, putting out the case that communities like mine were stronger and more prosperous and fairer as part of the European Union. Now, the referendum result may have got, produced a different view from the general public, but I don't believe any of the facts have changed that supported my view. In fact, I believe that Brexit was missold to us. We were promised more money for the NHS, we're getting cuts. We were promised that this would be a chance for the British people to take back control, and instead we have the government proposing a Henry VIII clause and actually trying to shut people out of the decisions at this time. And indeed, we've had the situation of Leave campaigners who, before the referendum, were hailing the opportunity for the British Parliament and British courts to take decision once again, then protesting and threatening civil disobedience if the Parliament and courts didn't decide things the way they wanted. And so we have this situation where the argument does have to continue because the very premise of Brexit, the very idea that was given to us, has turned out to be completely false. And this idea of a red, white and blue Brexit, as we've been offered, is equally a sham. When we look at the details, we see that what we're in fact getting is a true blue Tory Brexit. And we should be certainly be resistant of that. And I'm proud to be a part of a political party that sees itself as part of a global movement. Last week, when the government was sending the Article 50 letter to uh, Donald Tusk, the Green Party was meeting in Liverpool. And it wasn't just the Green Party in England and Wales. It was a Congress of the European Greens and the Global Greens. Because ultimately, we see ourselves as part of a worldwide movement for sustainability and fairness. And I see myself not just as a citizen of Wigan and Greater Manchester, but as a citizen of Europe and a citizen of the world. And no referendum result will take that identity away from me. And that's why I'm proud to be part of a political party that celebrates free movement and doesn't shy away from that fact. I celebrate the idea that we can live, love and work in countries across Europe. I celebrate the idea that the freedom of movement means that we can move and learn just as much as other people can come here and gain from our experience and take part in our community. And I want to preserve that, that freedom. Because ultimately, the idea of taking rights away from people who have come here goes against some of the ideas of the identity we all hold. If Brexit was about who we are as a country and who we want to be, then let's just ask ourselves this. After we signed up to the European Economic Community and the Common Market, after we signed up for new countries to join the European Union, and we said that people who came from those countries to the UK should come and have the same rights and responsibilities as citizens of the UK, do we want to be the kind of country then breaks that promise that we made to them for the sake of political expediency? For me, the answer is a resounding no. I say we keep those rights, we keep those responsibilities, we keep the ability for people to come and work in our NHS because I've seen the struggle in our local hospitals, not because of the amount of people coming here to use the NHS services, but because of neighbouring hospitals closing, neighbouring services being shut down, because they cannot get the staff to support them. So we need to keep the flow of people coming in and working. <coughs> and more than that, we need to stand on the principle that we are open and that we are tolerant. That's, that's my vision for Greater Manchester, this idea that ultimately you have come to live here, you have come to work here, you have made your home here, and fundamentally you are welcome here. That's why the Brexit vote was not about the border around the country, but as I think all the participants have said so far, it was the borders that they built within the country, that division of communities. And so the Mayor's job, as I think we've all touched on, is to tackle the scourge of hate crime and tackle the rise of the far right here in Greater Manchester. And we need to push for that democracy, because for all the promises we've had of taking back control, it seems that that's been reduced to a very small elite at the heart of government. And when I was out campaigning in Wigan, 
The one point that lead voters said to me that I had difficulty arguing against was this idea that, particularly from the older voters who voted in the 1975 referendum, that what we were offered, or what the EU is now, is not what they voted for then. And that the evolution of the EU is something that's shot many people out as, as that process took place. <coughs> we cannot afford, as we go through the Brexit process, to keep making that mistake. We must have an open process, a conversation that the whole people of Greater Manchester and the whole country can take part in. Because democracy is not just about having your vote and going back in your box until there's another one. It's about making sure that there's an ongoing discussion, an ongoing dialogue, and an ongoing debate. And ultimately, a final vote to sign off any deal that is proposed at the end of this process. That's what I'm standing for. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, this is about all of us working together. And as a friend of mine once said, what matters in life is not where you come from, it's where we are going together. That's what I'm standing for as your man. Thank you uh, very much to, uh, to all for uh, uh, keeping to your, uh, your five minutes. Um, we are uh, now coming to the first uh, round of our questions and answers, which is the, uh, the economic implications of uh, uh, Brexit, particularly for, uh, for Manchester. And before I open the, um, uh, the floor to the audience to ask questions, let me just perhaps uh, uh, start with one of my, uh, of my own and uh, um, perhaps tell you that the, the uh, and you probably know that better than me, that the consensus uh, at least uh, among uh, many uh, uh, academics, is that uh, post-Brexit, uh, the British government will have to lower taxes, will have to uh, kind of uh, uh, engage in a race to the bottom uh, in order to, att to attract uh, uh, inward investment into the UK, and in that way, compensate for the uh, uh, problems that Britain's, uh, uh, Britain's ed exit from the single market uh, will cause to the economy. So, I guess the question here is that uh, um, you are all being very uh, nice to, uh, to the audience here. You all want to attract uh, investment, you all want to protect uh, uh, jobs here. But ultimately, you will be a small part of a ship that will be going in completely the different direction to the one that uh, you both seem to be advocating here. And uh, uh, um, the question for my part, I guess, would be to tell us exactly how are you going to, uh, to attract uh, uh, investment? How are you going to protect uh, uh, the rights of internationals who live here? Could it be that you will not be relevant in tackling this, uh, uh, um, um, this issue? Perhaps it might be too simple, I don't know. But let me perhaps uh, uh, um, uh, invite others to, uh, to contribute here. Uh, specific questions uh, with regards to uh, the economic impact uh, of uh, Brexit, yes? Yeah? Um, my, my role is Um, I have a role within Britain for Europe and the 48% uh, to track Brexit job losses. I track that through a Facebook page of the same name, Brexit Job Losses. So far I've tracked 36,000 specific job losses, which I can absolutely pin on Brexit through the, uh, mainly through either uh, the impact of immigration or the impact of the exchange rate. Um, how is that, which is, sorry, it only says clearly accelerating, I've seen 5,000 in the last month. How is that going to affect the priorities of the mayoral office in Manchester? Mm -hmm. uh, any more uh, uh, questions on uh, that, uh, that topic? Don't be shy. <laughs> Anyone else would like to uh, Talk about perhaps universities or uh, uh, investment or uh, the labour market. Oh. Hello. Uh, I would like to know the specific pos uh, position of all US majors. If uh, coming from London or from anywhere else, you were to decide whether <coughs> you would allow other companies in Manchester uh, to be asked to register or make a registration of the <coughs> of the no, uh, EU workers on the list and what would be what would be your position towards that if you would allow that to happen specifically 
directly or indirectly. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, any more uh, questions? <laughs> I'm a freelance translator, and uh, as, free, uh, as translators, most of us are freelancers, and uh, the industry in this country has a policy of um, people always working into their mother tongues. Um, now, what I find a bit worrying for, for our industry is that freelancers never seem to get mentioned at all, and, and I have a suspicion that perhaps um, the Home Office would not be terribly keen on coming here as freelancers, but um, to Britain this, this does enormous damage um, because obviously as you're trying to sell things you better speak the buyer's language and uh, if, if, um, if we find that, that, it will, you know, that, that there will be problems in future for, for people to come here and, and to work into, into their uh, languages, that, that will be a major obstacle. And one thing that also worries me is that um, if you sort of look at the Home Office website and, and all the different visas and so on, and, and look at the professions that are in demand, now although I know that linguists are terribly in demand, you would not find linguists in that list. So Can it seems to me... a question? Yes. So, so what I would like to know is, have you ever considered um, the position of freelancers and, and uh, sort of what you would like to do for them. Okay. Uh, let me uh, uh, give the, uh, the floor to um, uh, the first let, Let's go in the same way. Uh, uh, so I think in my opening remarks, I sort of set out um, four, four things that I thought we could do that would make Greater Manchester resilient to what is going to be a very turbulent time for our economy. And most people have sort of said to me, well, you know, sure, the economy's doing all right, we haven't seen the, the effect yet. In my view, that is what we haven't left yet. Um, so, of course, we haven't seen the effect yet. We haven't seen, we haven't seen um, that happen. <coughs> what we need to do, I think, is to be concentrating very clearly on how do we make our economy resilient with some of those points that I have before. But specifically, I think two additional things that, that we can do. Um, we have to uh, be able to give uh, confidence to our businesses, uh, to investors, that when they come to Greater Manchester, we have a plan for where new homes will be, where new jobs will be, where new transport links will be, uh, so that we can say that on a spatial level, uh, that as we're going to compete with cities around the world for investment, that there is confidence uh, that can be given to investors that we know uh, what we're doing. And that's why, um, and there will be, uh, in whatever form it ends up being in future, uh, things like the spatial framework and so on are so important, so fundamentally even more important than what they were before, because we've got to be able to set out strategically, economically, spatially, uh, what is the plan for uh, Greater Manchester. Um, secondly, the Northern Powerhouse Independent Economic Review, which was um, launched last year, looked at different sectors across the north of England that said, well, what are our skills? What are those sectors that are potentially global? Things like uh, advanced manufacturing, life sciences, health innovation, and so on. These are strengths for the north of England and the Greater Manchester. I think we need to be able to very clinically promote those uh, strengths around the world to attract that investment. If we do that, I think we are, again, helping us to uh, overcome it. Um, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, I think we, in the specific, specific answer to the question around, um, you know, sort of, I think we need to have data available to us around um, you know, who is in our companies, because it's important that we have evidence-based policy that comes back. I don't think, however, uh, that uh, publishing that and creating divisions, uh, which I think it potentially does, is a particularly helpful thing uh, to do, so I don't, I don't support uh, that. In relation to, to free, uh, freelancers, um, I, one of the, I would say this, wouldn't I? I mean, a Conservative mayor, Greater Manchester, would give us a very powerful voice with the Conservative government in uh, Westminster. I think that's, uh, that's, that's important. And I think you know, all of these different Things. There are many things in negotiations that I don't think yet will have been thought about, and this may be uh, one of the points here, and we need to have negotiations that are flexible and responsive enough to respond to new points uh, as they're raised, and uh, make sure that we do that if I was elected as uh, mayor. Can I perhaps uh, ask a follow-up question to you? Do you think that the taxes around the, uh, the country are too high? Yeah, and, uh, well, I think, and listen, you just jogged my memory, the thing that I didn't say then is uh, the, the need, pressing need, to have fiscal devolution uh, in, uh, in, in the UK. 
I think is also going to be greater um, in, in future, so that we can so that we can have a great uh, fiscal platform that gives us an ability to be able to respond to help us support the Greater Manchester uh, economy. And I'm, I'm a low tax uh, person, but I, you know, but, I, but I also know that we you know, we all need to pay it. And so it's getting that balance right between. You know, the problem with our taxation system, I think, in the UK is it's been fragmented, it isn't particularly so flexible, it's designed to be. We need to have much more, um, well, reform of that. And if, if, here in Greater Manchester, if we can get uh, the evolution of different levies, different stamp, you know, stamp duty, for example, and others, then I think we can then do something that will be responsive to uh, helping us support our economy. Okay. Jane? Okay, we've got a number of questions contained within that, but it's within the theme of the economic implications. I think on this occasion, Sean's right, we haven't yet seen the full economic implications, but as the questioner here pointed out, we've already started to. It's shocking that we've, we've tracked 36,000 job losses already. That is quite concerning and very, very worrying. I mean, by nature, I'm an optimistic person. I believe in hope and I'm confident in the future. But actually, Brexit doesn't give you all that much hope, but I still think as your leaders, and as your Greater Manchester Mayor, we need to promote the positives for our city. However, there are things that are of concern. There's a question over there about the, um, the EU workers and whether we should be collecting data. I think data collection is useful <clears throat> because then we get an idea of where our EU workers are and what the impact is on the economy. That's important. But like sure, I wouldn't want to publish that data because I think it would be unfair on, on the EU workers themselves, but we still need to collect the data. On that subject of data, something that particularly concerns me that I heard of recently are that um, children of immigrants or who are unsure of their status that may have problems having access to education. I was really deeply concerned when I heard that because actually if we think about children who come to our country, does it matter where their parents are from? They're still entitled to the same education as the, the children around them. So things like that, I think we should be open and tolerant to make sure all our services are accessible to all people, wherever they're from. If they're in the UK, we should be open and transparent with our services. So I think the main question was around in terms of the economy and um, there were some questions about the, at the back there about the linguists. Um, my mother was um, a teacher of English as a second language in Greater Manchester in Wally Range as I grew up and she still carried on with that role teaching Vietnamese refugees when they came over to her country. So I've been brought up in that open, tolerant environment. And um, she's now a UK resident in the EU. She's left to live in France. So it concerns me about her role there and her status as, and, and what's Theresa May, it concerns me very deeply about how we are treating our EU nationals in the UK and how what's going to happen to our UK nationals who are in Europe. So there are a lot of issues that are unresolved. I think there's a lot of anxiety about this issue. And I think we need to get those things on the table and solutions as quickly as possible so people can feel secure about where they are. In terms of the, um, the damage about um, to freelance workers, again, there's another point there. Actually, it does concern me that people have some job insecurity now around particular roles, like um, people who are linguists. That, that is a big concern. To ask questions, answer questions about taxes, and is that what you wanted to, to kind of think about? I can, I can ask a follow-up question just for you. Okay, so I think I'm going to get a follow-up question on taxes, so I'll, I'll wait for that. Right. Um, the the follow-up question was that, uh, uh, of course, uh, Manchester has a, a student population that is nearly 100,000 strong. Uh, probably 10-15% of them are EU nationals uh, studying here. Post-Brexit, would you uh, support or oppose the increase in the tuition fees to the level of international students, which would be something like 15 or 16,000 pounds a year? <laughs> <laughs> so the question about tuition fees on what, even nationals, EU post nationals. Well, I think our universities, in terms of promoting our economy, they need to be open and diverse to our European students as well as our UK students. So I don't. I want to have a level playing field there personally because I think we need we need our European Union students to come here and to study here and to work here because that's the future, isn't it? If we're going to be a European country, which we are, we need to be welcoming and tolerant and open to all students from all over the world, from the European Union, from outside the European Union. We want 
to share our um, resources here in terms of the opportunities the study of the work. So I think I would be in favour of um, supporting that. Thank you. Um, I'll deal with the two specifics and then come back to the broader question. So, first, I'd just like to congratulate you on the work you're doing. I think it's critically uh, important. In the House of Commons, on the recent Article 50 votes, I voted both again to secure the status uh, of EU nationals um, a fortnight ago, but also for the meaningful vote. Uh, because I actually feel this debate will change. You know, public opinion will change as we go through this journey. And I think it's really important that we keep those opportunities to look at the evidence and, and reassess as we go along. So I, I would just want to commend you and encourage you to keep that focus on Greater Manchester for the mayor, whoever that is, so that that argument can be, uh, can be, can be put over uh, to people. Because I think public opinion will continue to change uh, on the issue. On the list idea, I completely oppose any idea of a published uh, list in the way that was put forward by the Home Secretary. Indeed, she put it forward in her Conservative Party conference speech. And as Shadow Home Secretary at the time, I led immediately a campaign against it, and she dropped it within a few, within a few days, and we haven't had it resurfaced since. So I took a very strong and clear position on that idea. You know, the idea of lists of people, it goes completely uh, against anything I, I believe in. We must stand against any drift in that direction. I think the, 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 the Home Secretary and even the current Prime Minister have flirted with those kind of ideas. We should fight those things absolutely uh, tooth and nail, and I will. Uh, on the broader question, in terms of how do we, uh, Dimitri, your question, and the point particularly about uh, more um, uh, casual workers, if I can put it that way, in the, in the economy. Um, the, the, big, the big argument I would make in terms of how do we handle this is I would seek to form an immediate alliance with my good friend Sadiq Khan um, to create a kind of North Pole and South Pole here in terms of a voice of reason and sanity, hopefully, in what is increasingly a, a debate run by, as I say, the right wing of the, of the Tory uh, party. And I think what we would argue for is, is, is a common sense position that, as I said, responds to some concerns about free movement, but does so in, in the minimal way so as to maximise our approach as pro-European continuing to welcome uh, people here. That, that is what I believe. I don't believe my constituents were asking for sweeping changes to free movement. They weren't actually, if you were listening carefully to what they, they were saying. They, they were asking for a greater degree of fairness. They wanted more protection of wages, because there have been examples in my constituency where wages were undercut. They wanted more support for public services, because there were examples where primary schools faced pressure, but they got no extra help to deal with it. There were very practical concerns, actually. You know, what we mustn't fall into the trap of doing is thinking that the 700,000 people in Great Manchester who voted to leave are in some way xenophobic or worse racist. They are not. The people of Great Manchester, in my view, in our history, have been some of the most warm and welcoming people uh, anywhere in the country, and indeed Europe. Uh, the numbers of people who come to work here as refugees, asylum seekers, or from other places. You know, this is a warm and welcoming place, and let's not lose sight of that. I think it's very important that we don't. Uh, they have practical concerns, which I think can be addressed through modest changes uh, to freedom of movement, that therefore... Can you be more specific? Because, well, actually, to be honest, if we implemented the system as it was, where if people didn't have a job, there was a, you know, there was a potential that they could uh, be asked to, re to return. The, the actual system that came in post Maastricht, if that had been implemented properly, as it is in other European countries... Yeah, well, 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 that's well, a very, very good, a very good question. And I, very, I, I find that very frustrating, actually, um, because I've argued for just modest change uh, to free movement, to meet the public concern. The failure to do that led to the big backlash against the whole, uh, the whole thing, and that was a real failure of of politics uh, over many years, uh, unfortunately. But I think the argument now is to, is to require modest changes to maximise our access to the single market. And particularly in your case, it, it's about saying that under a, a system, the, the position of different groups of workers are recognised uh, and there, there isn't then a, a barrier to people coming, living and working here. If people are working here and gainful employment, then they should be able to continue to come and contribute to our economy. And so, can I just uh, perhaps uh, um, uh, add a uh, small follow-up question here? I mean, um, I'm always, as an academic, very worried when I hear anecdotal evidence, you know, that uh, uh, there is anecdotal evidence in my constituency, wages were um, kind of uh, um, uh, 
use of this out of EU uh, national regulations there, or that there is pressure on uh, local services. Is there a study uh, that uh, we can uh, read uh, with numbers that actually proves that point? Yes. Beyond the anecdotal? Yes, yes, there is. There's a Bank of England study on the effect of free movement on wages, which was published, I think, in uh, March, February or March last year. And what it showed, and this is why I would say it would substantiate my argument for modest changes to free movement, what it showed was there was largely no or even a beneficial impact on wages in the vast majority of the economy. However, uh, in the unskilled uh, category, there was a 2% downward uh, uh, fall in wages. So there was evidence that uh, free movement had had a negative impact on wages at the lowest end of the labour market. By 2%? By 2%. That was a Bank of England uh, study. Now, people argued, came back and said, oh, well, that, well that's not very much. You know, and I, I agree, it's not very much. But for people on the lowest wages, it was a real impact. Uh, and I, you cannot ignore that. And it's why I've always made the argument, I believe freedom of movement rules should be changed to protect skilled wages to prevent agencies uh, coming in and bringing shifts in to undercut uh, existing wage levels or undercut skilled wage levels. And again, the failure of Europe to reform on that point, in my view, left us open to losing the referendum. Great, thank you. Can I, can I just like... Uh, let's say, uh, yeah, one moment, you, you'll come back. Well, firstly, in terms of the work you're doing, in tracking those job losses, is I think we've all said that's important work and we've seen the evidence in communities across Greater Manchester as well. I think one thing we do need to be wary of though is making sure that we don't just assume that Brexit is the root cause of every failure that is going on and every job loss. In some cases, these are actually relatively weak businesses where Brexit is actually just making the difference between that business succeeding and failing and there were some systemic weaknesses in the way that business was operating as, as things stood. So we need to, I think, start stress testing businesses a little better and safeguard. Okay. Uh, but you're absolutely right though, the job losses are happening and we need to be innovative in the jobs that we have going forward. We need to make sure that we have a more decentralised economy across Greater Manchester to ensure that there's no brain drain from the outer boroughs to the centre or to outside Greater Manchester. And we need to make sure that we don't compartmentalise our economy so individual communities aren't reliant on one specific industry and then find themselves in serious trouble if anything should happen to that industry and happen to that economic sector. Uh, in terms of the register of workers, uh, I think it's right that we collect the data just so we can see where there are uh, EU nationals working. We can identify any issues where the particular sectors where EU nationals are not well represented and also track any instances of discrimination and exploitation that are going on. But absolutely, the sort of name and shame approach that's being adopted by the government is just plain beyond the pale. It's completely unacceptable, and I will oppose that completely. And in terms of the workers, freelancers and linguists, as someone with a linguistics degree in three languages at A-level and uh, having worked as an interpreter for a voluntary organisation on a couple of occasions, I should probably declare an interest here. Uh, but, uh, no, the work you do is absolutely vital. It's vital that we do actually have that community that we're supporting language learning still in this country, that we're supporting the work of interpreters who do come in. And this is why I'm such a big supporter of free movement as it stands. Because the visa regulation we have are already too complex. And there's not enough thought or preparation that's been gone in to what will come after Brexit. We've got this rather ridiculous situation where the designers of Football Manager 2017 have planned for the new visa regulations better than the UK government have. That's completely unacceptable again, so that's why I support, again, maintaining free movement and more support for freelancers.